it's our first Coast to Coral bonus bite um, and it's the Citizen Science Month. And as we've seen, we can't get out and do citizen science. We thought we'd bring citizen science to your living room. So let's get into it. Okay, so what is a sea slug? So I'm just going to give a really brief introduction to what a sea slug is. Um, often when I'm rock pooling or going diving, people go, oh, what are you looking for? And I go, sea slugs, and I get a really blank look. Um, so most people don't know what they are. So I thought, well, I'll give everybody a brief introduction and then you'll all have a bit of an idea. Okay, so simplified taxonomy. So sea slugs are a common name applied to members of the heterobranchia, um, which falls under the class of gastropoda in the phylum of mollusca. So they're related to mollusks, so all your other shelled animals like your, you know, your clams and your cowries, etc. But slugs have evolved slightly differently and some have still got their shells, some have lost it and some have internalised it. Um, a lot of people refer to sea slugs as nudie branks, which is not technically correct. Um, we're still, some people call them nudie branches, which is the incorrect pronunciation because nudie brank comes from Latin. So nudie means naked and brank means gill. Um, so a nudie branchia is only one order of heterobranchia and therefore technically it's not correct for all sea slugs, but we're happy to roll with nudie branks if people call them nudie branks. All right, so some basic anatomy. So most of them have a gill, which just sits on the back here, and they use that for respiration same deal as our lungs or fish gills. Um, they also have rotifers on the, on the front, which are used a bit like our nose. So they're used to sense um, chemicals in the water. And then they have this thing called a buccal mass, which is like sticking your lips over something that you're about to munch on. Uh, and that contains the radula if they have them. But they're pretty cool because they actually have um, pockets. So they have gill pockets and rhinophore pockets. So if they feel threatened, they can actually withdraw the gills and the rhinophores into the pockets. Um, because if you think about it, your gills are quite important. So you want to protect them where you can. Then we have, these are aeolids. Um, so you'll see they're a completely different sort of body structure. And then they have these serrata and they perform the same function effectively as the gills. So they use that for oxygen you know, transfer. Um, and then you've still got your rhinophores on the front, but quite often your aeolids will have really obvious oral tentacles and they use those for finding their way around. So if you can think of, if you're walking around in the dark, you're feeling in front of you, they basically use those for the same sort of thing to find food, um, and find out where they're going. And then this one is, this is a sea hare, but those senses of um, touch and smell are really important because sea slugs don't have eyes like we do. So in this one, it looks like it's got a really distinct eye, but it's not actually an eye that functions like ours. It only senses light and dark. Um, so the oral tentacles and the rhinophores are really important for it finding food, finding its way around and finding a mate. These ones have a, a shell just in the back here. Um, it's a very thin shell, but it also has these parapodia and they can actually use them for swimming if they have to. Now, this is a scanning electron microscope photo of radula and this is one is a sponge feeder. And so you can see these look like a, a grater or a rasp and they can actually just rasp off the sponge to eat. Now, there's a little scale bar here in the corner and this is 10 micrometers. And a human hair is somewhere between 20 to 200 micrometers. So each one of these is smaller than a human hair. But you can imagine that if this was the size of a, you know, a crocodile or something, it would be really, really scary. These are not my photos, I don't have and scanning electron microscope. So I've borrowed them from some published papers. Um, not all um, nudibranchs actually have radula. Some of them can actually secrete a digestive enzyme 
and it sort of turns the food to soup where then they can just suck it up. Um, there's others that suck in the food and then they have gizzard plates that grind it up. This one here, this is from a, from a sack of glossa from a, a, um, an algae eating sap sucking slug. And they actually have a row of these and they use this to pierce the algae and then they suck up the, um, the insides. All right, so um, from the previous slide, you would have noticed we've actually got like 10 orders or super families of, of heterobranchia. So this is the first one. And where I've got the family, number of families up the top, that's the number of families in that order or super family that we have found um, on the Sunshine Coast. So this one is Actinoidea, and this is your bubble shells. And these are really pretty. Um, this one's Hydatinophysis. They tend to be nocturnal, so you don't always find them in the daytime. But I have actually found them at Kings Beach in the rock pools in the day. Uh, they can't withdraw into their shell. But they have this U-butte head shield out the front that protects the mantle so the dirt doesn't go in underneath the shell. They feed on polychaete worms. The Aplicida, this order is dominated by the sea hares and you can see these in, in the rock pools. This one used to be called Aplicia parvula, but there's been a lot of taxonomic research done and it's now been split into 10 different species. Uh, but because they didn't sequence any from here, we don't know exactly which one ours is. Um, so we're just calling it Parvula complex for the moment. Um, but these guys are, are really cool. They've got a, a defense mechanism where they, if they're threatened or accidentally squashed, they'll secrete a purple dye. And that's actually got two components. One's the purple dye, which acts a bit like a smoke screen. And apparently there's also a clear um, secretion that apparently smells. I've never smelt it, but some scientists have worked it out. And these guys feed on algae. The Cephalaspidea. And these are your head shield slugs. And these are considered to be a primitive slug because they've got a fairly simple anatomy. And again, they've got this head shield that allows them to plough through the substrate um, while protecting their mantle. Most of this order are carnivorous and they eat foraminiferums and polychaete worms. And um, we've actually seen one species in this order cruising around on a leathery soft coral, picking off the acel or flatworms as it was going. Now, this is your true nudibranch, and this is the largest and most diverse order. So, obviously, who came up with this order had one of this sort and went, okay, it's got gills. Remember, nudibranch means naked gill. So you've got this really obvious gill sitting on the back. But there's exceptions to the rule. And some of them actually now have gills under the mantle. And some of them, they're completely absent. So, but they're all still called nudibranchia. Uh, they all have species specific diets. And that includes things like sponges, ascidians, um, hydroids, anemones, soft and hard corals. And then some of the sea slugs actually eat other sea slugs. Some of them chew on them gradually and just slowly wear them down. Um, others just suck them up whole. Pleurobranchida, these are side gill slugs and these have the gills located um, on the right side between the mantle and the foot. But that's where it can get confusing because if you remember, some of the nudibranchia also have the gills between the mantle and the foot. But there are other anatomical features that separate out this order. And they have a trapezoidal oral veil and well tentacles. They're also carnivorous. They're generally nocturnal, so we don't often see them in the daytime. You might find them hiding under a rock or you'll find them on night dives. But these guys have got a really cool defense mechanism and it's called autotomy. So they can actually cast off bits of their mantle. So you can see these lines here on this one it can actually throw them off like a lizard does with its tail and you end up with a slug that looks like this. So all that's left is the central piece of the mantle and then there's the gills that we were talking about under the right side. I believe they do grow back. And the uh, it's the pointy one, the spiky one at the beginning with the serrata, they can also cast the serrata off um, again for defense mechanisms. Terrapoda, these are beautiful. These are your uh, wing foot or sea butterflies. They're pretty small, 
they um, have a, still got a shell in here. Most of, most of the sea slugs live on the substrate, so you find them on the bottom. There's only a few that really don't live down there. One is your, your Glaucus atlanticus, the one that feeds on the blue bottles and you find them washed up on the beach. Um, there's another one that will uh, attach under flotsam, but most of them live on the bottom, but this one doesn't. It spends its entire life in the plankton. Um, so you generally don't see them. Mostly they're photographed um, during things that call black water dives, which is basically hanging on a rope under a boat in the pitch black in the middle of the ocean and trying to photograph things that are zooming by and get them in focus. I haven't tried it. Apparently it's good fun. But we actually had, um, I don't know what you call a swarm of these come through um, about 12 months ago in the daytime and my dive buddies were actually able to see them from the boat. So that was really amazing. The Ringiculoidea, these are considered to be the most primitive of sea slugs um, and are related more closely to slugs from ancient eras. Um, they also burrow through the, um, through the silt, through the substrate, and they feed on foraminiferums and copepods. Then the Runcinida, they look similar to the Cephalaspidea, the, the head shield slugs, but they've actually got a different line of ancestors. They tend to be small and flat, and this is actually a, a photo taken on a microscope. So you can see it's quite small. It was only about two or three mil long. And this particular one, this is really cool because this is Ilbia Ilby. And it's known more widely from further south down around Victoria. So we're really quite lucky here because we're on that transition zone between tropical and temperate waters. We do tend to get a mix of slugs here. This is not a very common critter though. Then we have the sap sucking slugs, um, the saccoglossa, and they, these are herbivores, and these are the ones with that dagger-like radula that they can pierce the algae and then suck up the inside. Some of them can actually sequester the chloroplast from the algae and then use it like solar power. Um, but members of this order can be a bit hard to to know which order they actually fit into because some have a shell that they can um, retract into, others have a bivalve shell, some have a reduced shell and then some have no shell at all. So it's really just a matter of learning which slugs fit into which order to know what they are. The Umbraculida, this is our last order. We've got two families in this order. So we've got this one, this is Tylodina corticalis and you can see it's an umbrella slug because it's got this Pretty little shell on its back, looks like it's wearing an umbrella. It feeds on a yellow sponge, and when it's actually hunkered down into the sponge feeding, it's quite often difficult to find it um, because the shell also gets this algae on it. And it's a, a relatively small slug, I suppose it's about, I don't know, 10 mil long. But then the other one we get, which is Umbraculum umbraculum, is the size of a dinner plate. But this one here, this is taken at Kings Beach. This one was easy to see because of this egg mass around the outside of it. But the thing is that on the shell, you can see there's all this turf algae, bit of asparagopsis and other green algae all growing on the shell. So when it's sort of hunkered down in its sponge, you quite often you can't actually see it. And it's only these little yellow fecal pellets that you find that can give away that it's there. Um, so there's a slightly better shot. This one is out in the open because it's actually just starting to lay an egg mass. So you can see it's still got the rhinophores, this is the foot, and then there's the shell. And again, it's all covered in algae, including the wonderful asparagopsis, everybody's favorite weed from Kings Beach. Now reproduction, now all sea slugs are hermaphrodites. So they have both male and female reproductive organs. And they generally mate right sides together. There are a few exceptions to that rule, as with most things, um, which means both individuals get fertilised at the same time and both are capable of laying egg masses, which when you think about it, it's probably a good thing when you move slowly and you can't see to find your partners when you get the chance, make it count and work on the best uh, amount of reproduction you can have. But they lay... Um, interesting egg masses and this one here you can see this is a hydroid in the background 
This one is wound around the branches of the hydroid and it's laid by this critter here. And this is my longer cornice. And you can see this is the serrata on this aeolid. This up here is a polyp on the hydroid that it's living on. So you can see it's mimicking its host very well. And then we have the rosettes and probably the most, I suppose, widely known one for people who go diving is the big pink one from Hexbranca sanguineus from the Spanish dancer. They're beautiful big pink egg masses, really easy to find. Then we have spaghetti looking egg masses and they're from your sea hares. And um, we found that they seem to be different colours depending on what the sea hare's been eating. So we've had brown ones and green ones and purple ones all laid in the same place. And then squiggly rosettes under a rock, but all of these egg masses contain thousands and thousands of eggs. So most sea slugs produce um, via a larval stage. And so the larvae is subject to tides and currents. So there's planktotrophic vellator larvae, lesser the trophic and then direct development. So your planktotrophic and your lecithotrophic spend um, some of their existence in, up in the plankton, floating around. Um, the planktonic ones have an extended plankton stage that allows for metamorphic competence, and it can feed and develop in the plankton. The lecithotrophic um, tends to have a shorter pelagic larval phase. It can feed if it needs to, but they need a chemical cue from a suitable food source in order to settle and then turn into slugs. The direct development ones though, they actually hatch as tiny little slugs on the food source or, or wherever they've actually been laid. So they become what we call endemic species and we have one here on the Sunshine Coast, which is this beautiful Glossodorus vespa. So because it hatches out as, as little nudibranchs, it isn't subject to the same vagaries of the currents as the, um, the larval ones. So if this turned up in Victoria, we'd be really excited and really want to know how on earth it got there. But the other ones that have larval stages, of course, can be swept on the East Australia current um, and all the other currents. So it's not unusual to have tropical species turning up um, further south than from where they're generally known. Okay, so as I said, that was a very brief introduction to sea slugs and most of the information came from this wonderful website, nudibranchdomain.org, put together by my wonderful friend and dive buddy, David Mullins. Um, there's lots more information on there, including most of the slugs that we've recorded here on the Sunshine Coast, which is over 700. And David is constantly updating this website with nudie notes and all sorts of really interesting information. Um, so please jump on and have a look. Um, Jody wants to know how long is the lifespan of sea slugs? No one really knows. They suspect um, they vary from a couple of weeks. I believe there's some, like the ones in the Antarctic that have a longer life stage, I think about 12 months, but no one really knows for sure. Um, Carolyn has seen a lot of rock, sea hares in the rock pools at Shelley. Um, yeah, they are a bit like a nursery for the sea hare because of all the algae that's there. Um, there's, a, there's a food source and we know that they lay those huge spaghetti-like stringy masses of eggs. So obviously some of that larvae is going to get washed away, but some of it will resettle there. And um, we noticed this at Moffat's that we went to recently just for the season for baby sea hares. Um, Ella wants to know about sea slugs in captivity. They're really hard to keep in captivity and that's because of what they feed on. So it's actually that their food source is hard to keep alive. So sponges and corals and algae and hydroids are really hard to keep in aquaria. Um, it seems to be more of a thing in the States than here. Um, and I believe it, it's very difficult because you can't keep the food source alive. I know the difference because she was doing something else between sea slugs and nudie banks. Basically, they're the, the same thing, but nudie brank is, comes from nudie branchia, which is just one order of sea slugs. So people just use it as a generic term. So it doesn't matter whether you call them sea slugs or nudie branks, we won't hold it against you. And then we have a lot of wonderful sponsors that we would like to thank. 
for supporting our presentations.